Welcome to Conversations. I'm Bill Crystal, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Paul Cantor, English professor at the University of Virginia, author of a new book, excellent book, Shakespeare's Roman Trilogy. Uh, we'll talk about a lot of the themes that Paul discusses in this book today. Your first book was called Shakespeare's Rome. A lot of variation there in your work over the last 40, 45 years, you know? Well, it's there is a huge matter. The truth is, as watchers of uh, viewers of these previous conversations know, there has been a, you've, wi you've, you've ranged widely in and then deeply popular culture, many, many other authors. I'm coming home in this book. You are coming back to Shakespeare's Rome. So let's talk about that. So why Rome and, and then why Shakespeare? But why Rome first? Well, Rome is just an incredibly important part of our culture to this day. It's one of the reference points in our culture and our politics. We're not very far here from a building that's called the Senate. Uh, it shows that our political order was to some extent modeled uh, on the Roman Republic. Uh, we have newspapers that call themselves the Tribune, the Chicago Tribune. <laughs> That's another distinctive Roman institution. Rome, in many ways, has shaped the world we live in. People are still fascinated with it. Uh, I think on the History Channel, uh, Rome is the third most important topic they cover after Hitler and ancient aliens. Yes, well, uh, UFOs must be way up there. Yeah, no, yeah. But, but, but Rome is right there next. That's good, yeah. And so it is fascinating, this uh, city that conquered the entire Mediterranean world. People have just been interested in uh, its success. All these great people it uh, uh, produced. Cincinnatus, who got a city in the Midwest right, named after. Right. It's astounding when you look around the world. Every time you go into an old bank building, it's got Roman columns up there. So Russian, no. Russian czars, that's yes, Caesar, yes, right? Yes, I mean, and the Kaiser, the German yeah, term emperors. Uh, so we have had many a country that has claimed to inherit the Roman Empire. The uh, Tsarist Russia did. Uh, even England claimed to be the third Troy. Troy, Rome, England. So it is there in our heritage, and to understand the world we live in, we have to understand Rome. So why Shakespeare? I mean, you could have studied, and you have studied actually Gibbon and a million other, many, many other yeah, authors, Machiavelli. But it, 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 this is partially biographical. The first, uh, my first serious encounter with Shakespeare was ninth grade in what was then called junior high school, and we studied Julius Caesar. And I just loved it. I mean, I, it was just a revelation to me. I'd never seen anything as great as this, the language, the drama, the power of it. And it's actually funny, as I, I read about it, I found these critics mentioning something called Coriolanus, and they said it was even better. It's a more Rome play. And I said, nothing can be better. <laughs> than Julius Caesar, and one day, this is back in New York, I'm listening to WBAI, and they used to broadcast Shakespeare plays on Saturday nights. That was another era, right? It certainly <laughs> was, <laughs> and I'm hearing a play, and I don't know what it is, and it is fantastic, the rhetoric, the powerful speeches, and I'm saying, how am I gonna fi find out what this is? And then suddenly there's that moment when Caius Martius conquers the Volscian city of Coriolanus, and they proclaim him Coriolanus, and you hear three times, Coriolanus, 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 I said, you know what? This is the play everybody said was better than Julius Caesar, and I decided it was. And then all I had to do was read Andy and Cleopatra, and I had the three great Roman plays. And what I came to conclude was that Shakespeare really cared about uh, ancient Rome. There's a theory among many people that his uh, Romans are just Elizabethan uh, right. Englishmen in disguise, just put a toga on an Englishman and we got Shakespeare's Romans. But no, I began to understand uh, he really was setting out to portray the Roman world and all its difference, and that's what interested him, and I found the more I studied Shakespeare, the more I could learn about Rome. Yeah, what struck me in the book, one of the things, many things that struck me, it's a wonderful book with many, uh, discussions, Nietzsche features prominently, and we'll get to that in a minute, but was that it's not really Shakespeare's Rome in the sense that it's as much about, Shakespeare was very interested in Rome and had a view of Rome as contrasted with other things, modernity and you know other, other human possibilities, but I used to emphasize the, the difference between the two Romes that he yes, portrays, and that is a, so Cor Coriolanus and yeah, Antony and Cleopatra. That, uh, we say Rome but in fact, there are two great phases of Roman history, the Republic 
and the empire. The Roman Republic uh, lasted roughly from 500 to 50 BC, and then there's a interregnum when it's making the transition, and then the the Western Roman Empire lasts another 500 or so years. Years it's in the 400s AD that the Western Rome uh, dissolves, and uh, it's interesting that when we visually picture Rome today, we are picturing the empire. That is, when you think of Rome, you think of the Colosseum, you think of uh, uh, Hadrian's tomb, you think of the Pantheon. Those things date uh, well into the empire. I, I mean, in fact, the Colosseum was built on the ruins of Nero's palace. Uh, uh, to reclaim the space for the city from this Roman emperor who took it to himself. Uh, and all that beautiful grand Rome is actually imperial. Almost nothing survives of Republican Rome. Uh, there's a couple of temples in a place called Largo, Argentina, and a couple of temples down by the Tiber. But famously, Augustus, the first emperor, uh, said of him he found Rome a city of brick and he turned it into a city of marble. And so the really grand Rome we think of in terms of the architecture, that's the empire. But uh, when we think of emperors, we also think of people like Nero and people like Caligula and uh, a lot of decadence in the Roman Empire. And the Roman Republic is the city of Republican virtue, of all the, especially the martial virtue. And there's a kind of confusing point here that much of the empire was acquired during the Republican era. It was the great armies of the Republic uh, that basically conquered the entire Mediterranean world. And though the empire advanced under the emperors uh, up until the point of Hadrian, who, who called it quits and said, we've gone as far as we're going to go, it was largely a holding action. Uh, and uh, Shakespeare seems to have been interested in the contrast between the Republic and Empire. In fact, my first book I called Shakespeare's Rome, Republic, and Empire, so that if you take the three plays he wrote... Yeah, let's uh, just walk through that. Yeah, so they, uh, uh, just to sketch it out, the Coriolanus uh, is the first historically. Again, the order in which they were written is probably Julius Caesar around 1600, 1599, uh, Coriolanus and Antony Cleopatra, maybe 1608, 1609, but I discuss them in historical uh, order, and it, it, to me it can't And there's be evidence that he conceived of them as a trilogy, or at least uh, the, once the, he'd written the first one, uh, yes, that the I latter mean, two, a, he certainly was aware he'd written Julius Caesar yes, once he yes, wrote, you know, yes. Antony uh, and Cleopatra. And there's no hard evidence, though we know he wrote two tetralogies. Right. That is, in the history plays, to take the better known one, Richard II, Henry IV, part one and two, and Henry V, tell a continuous story of the fall of the Plantagenet dynasty, Plantagenet dynasty, the rise of the House of Lancaster. Uh, it shows that he did think in terms of larger units than a single play, and in a way I am claiming in a book curiously called Shakespeare's Roman Trilogy, uh, that these three plays form a trilogy, and my evidence would be that in Coriolanus he deals with the founding moment <coughs> of the Roman Republic, uh, uh, which came into being when the Romans threw off Etruscan tyranny. They were being ruled by kings uh, uh, from Etruria, uh, and the last of them, Tarquin the Proud, had a son who raped a Roman maiden, Lucretia, and that was the last straw for the Romans. These tyrannical foreign kings, they rape our, our daughters and our wives, uh, and they threw out the Tarquins and created a republic. Uh, and what Coriolanus deals with, uh, characters in that play... And historically, Coriolanus comes a little bit after the founding of the Republic, but not... Well, it's, you know, at, at the time. Uh, uh, the Tarquins are living memory. Coriolanus, okay. as a boy, fought against the Tarquins. So really is early Republic. Yes, and what makes it so important a moment, and for example, Machiavelli concentrates on it in his discourses on Livy, his account of Republican Rome, is this is when the uh, people got their tribunes. 
And that is the distinctive institution of the Roman Republic, which makes it a what's called a mixed regime. Uh, that is, uh, it's a combination of monarchy, uh, uh, aristocracy, and democracy. The Roman Republic uh, had as executives two consuls uh, who were uh, vested with the executive power. They were the generals of the armies, which was the fundamental executive power in those days. That was, if you will, the monarchical element of the regime. And then there was the Senate, which was the aristocratic element, uh, consisting of basically the large landowners uh, who deliberated on Roman policy and basically ran things. Uh, but then there was a popular assembly there were these so-called plebeians who were not slaves. They, they were free, uh, but poor and uh, agricultural. They worked on the big estates and so on. And they felt uh, left out of the regime as, uh, as the play opens, as Coriolanus opens. Uh, they're uh, uh, starving from a famine and they rebel wanting grain. And what they're given instead of grain is tribunes. Uh, and this institutionalized a democratic component uh, in the Roman regime because the tribunes were the representatives of the people. That's why so many newspapers fancy themselves. Right, you right. remember the New York Herald Tribune, do, for yes, example, yes. Uh, right. and of course still the Chicago Tribune. Uh, but uh, the tribunes had remarkable power in a regime that seemed to be ruled by these aristocrats, namely they could veto anything the Senate did. And they were also, this is a, they were also sacrosanct. They could not be killed. Now you would think everybody could yeah, not right. be killed, but in fact they were uniquely positioned that it was a blasphemy to kill one. Not that the patricians didn't occasionally kill a tribune, mm. but, uh, but it gave them a lot of power that they, uh, you had to think twice before killing one. Roman politics was pretty rough uh, uh, back then. But it did, uh, uh, you know, Machiavelli concentrates on it, something that was unique to the Roman regime uh, to give that much power to the people. Uh, and so I think, you know, Shakespeare chose that moment to portray. Now, jumping ahead, uh, he wrote Julius Caesar, which deals with the end of the Republic, the beginning of the empire. It's the whole issue in the play that the uh, Julius Caesar is taking over the city. Uh, uh, Rome had been so determined to avoid one-man rule. Uh, they hated the name of kingship, but here Julius Caesar, he had already been appointed dictator for life at this point, and he, he's thinking of getting crowned, and we see the uh, conspiracy to restore the Republic, and how it fails. And then Antony and Cleopatra portrays the beginning of the empire, has the character Octavius Caesar, who went on to become Augustus Caesar, first official Roman emperor. So if you look at the three plays he chose to write, he seems specially interested in the Republic versus Empire issue, and specifically how the Republic come into being, how did it go out of be, uh, existence, and how did the Empire emerge. And my sense is that, or somehow maybe this is an American uh, bias, but people are kind of, most thinkers seem to have been pro-Republic and anti-Empire. One has Empire, one thinks, you know, living off the greatness of the, the the acquisitions of the Republic and gradual decadence hastening near the end. Yes, Republic uh, is the kind of noble public spirit. Yes, and I mean, you, you, uh, just to show how all pervasive this is, this is Star, Star Wars, uh, the uh, noble Republic and the corrupt Empire. Right. That motif has just but which grows out of the Republic. Yes, so the Republic can't be that noble. Exactly. I mean, in that, is that sense, a, is that a yeah. Thing? I mean, what Shakespeare shows is the uh, corruption of the Republic produces the Empire, and specifically, I'd say the acquisition of a foreign empire corrupts Republican institutions and therefore produces an imperial regime. That I think is the deepest theme of these three plays as a whole, and it uh, it surprises people when I claim that Shakespeare was, shall we say, a Republican with a small r. That is, the standard view of Shakespeare is he lived under a monarchy and he must have supported monarchy. Well, he did not go in the street and agitate uh, for the overthrow of Elizabeth I. Uh, but in fact, I think he was part uh, of the stirrings of Republican thinking 
uh, in late 16th century uh, England. The people who dispute this forget that in 1649, yeah. Britain became a republic. Somebody was thinking for about decade, it for eleven it, years or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, and it would, Cromwell failed. And and by the way, when, there's a very good book that came out fairly recently uh, by a man named Andrew Hatfield called Shakespeare and Republicanism, and he you know openly challenged this assumption. Uh, uh, part of the problem is the word republic was not used in Elizabethan discourse. But they spoke about Commonwealth. That was the term they used. And I've lived much of my life in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or the Commonwealth of Virginia. Right. And you can see the people who came over to the United States uh, were Republicans in many ways, and they, they called it a Commonwealth. Uh, uh, Milton in the 1650s wrote a ready and easy way to establish a free commonwealth. So it's funny, people, they don't see the word republic and they think no one's talking about it, but they actually are. Uh, and so uh, the I think Shakespeare is part of what's called the classical Republican tradition, which goes all the way back to Rome itself and stretches forward to Montesquieu and the Founding Fathers and well into the 19th century. Uh, he, he was very impressed by Republican virtue. And for him, the central contrast is between citizens and subjects. That in a republic you have citizens and in an empire you have subjects. And from a political point of view, that's the problem with empire. Uh, uh, it's very nicely crystallized by Cassius and Julius Caesar when he says to Brutus, the fault of Brutus is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. And that's the Republican principle that human beings have control of their own destiny. That was the point of the Republican system. Uh, so for example, the consuls. It really does surprise us. There were always two consuls and they served for one year. And imagine if the presidential right. term was only one year. And there were two of them. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and that there were two of them. But the idea was anything to avoid one man from becoming too powerful. So you had the two consuls. They had to agree on major stuff, like going to war. They could veto each other. They only lasted one year, and you could not uh, succeed yourself as consul. You could become consul later, but the idea was to stock Rome with a lot of people who would have had top-level executive experience, and they would pride themselves. You know, we talk, I think, what do we have, six living presidents? Or, uh, Maybe that's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. They would pride themselves, we got 42 living right, consuls. Right, right. And the idea was nobody can say I'm indispensable. And if someone starts saying, you know, you you can't win a battle without me, they say, well, we got six guys who won battles. We'll make one of them consul. In some ways, if you look at the consulship, it gives you an idea of what Republican Rome was about. First of all, give opportunities of the highest glory to everyone. You know, again, we say, we like to say every American can dream of being president. Uh, <laughs> Maybe, but when you have two consuls changing every year, it sort of was more reasonable to think, if, you, if you're a patrician, uh, uh, that uh, you can uh, you have a reasonable expectation of being consul. So that, for example, you don't assassinate a consul to make room for yourself. It's astounding the degree to which assassination became political uh, practice in the uh, empire, and Shakespeare shows it in Antony Capatra. There, at that point, there's not quite an, uh, uh, an emperor, there's a triumvirate. Octavius, Lepidus, and Antony are sharing rule, and uh, there's a guy called uh, Pompey, and one of his subordinates says, they have him on a barge for conference, he says, I'll kill them all. I will, uh, I, will, I will make you the lord of the whole world. And it's actually a very Machiavellian moment because Pompey says, you should have done it, and then I would have been okay with it. But now that you ask me, I have to say no. Uh, again, that's true to what happened historically at that moment, but it shows that assassination was going to become regularized under the empire when you had one emperor and emperor for life. Right. Uh, and no term limits except by assassination. And again, that's a perfect contrast between the Republican empire and it, it's what Shakespeare shows is the difference. 
participation, the nature of the republic uh, was widespread participation in the regime. Now, not everyone had full participation. Again, pretty much only patricians could become consul, although at a few points in Roman history, they let plebeians become consul. It was actually a trick by the patricians to give the plebeians a consul and let them see what a disaster uh, it would be. And then a hundred years, they wouldn't ask for another plebeian uh, consul. But uh, 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 even the common people had a role in the regime. If you were ambitious among the common people, your ambition was to become tribune. And it's a very honored position. Shakespeare shows the tribunes and coronets absolutely basking in the glory of their position. One of the patricians says to them, you are ambitious for poor knaves' caps and legs. Uh, and uh, you, at some point, they're, they're adjudicating things, and they feel very proud that the people are coming to them to solve their problems. So the Roman Republic really satisfied the ambitious side of human nature. And the but not Coriolanus. Yeah. What about Coriolanus, though? Well, I mean, Cor the person. Well, not the, you know, yeah. Well, I mean, the uh, person in the play. I mean. Yeah. I mean, here, uh, this is why it's a tragedy, and I always have to remind people that Shakespeare wrote tragedies. Uh, in that sense, didn't have a big optimistic view of the world, and Coriolanus is a tragedy of the perfect Roman who's too perfect for Rome. That is, he has been bred uh, as a patrician warrior. He has had remarkable military success. Uh, even as a young man, he uh, 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 got a, the, the Congressional Medal of Honor <laughs> for bravery, uh, the equivalent of it. Uh, and as the uh, play opens in the first act, uh, the Romans have been attacked by their neighbors, the Volskis, and Coriolanus is one of the leaders in the army, and he more or less conquers a Volskian town single-handedly. Uh, that is, uh, when he charges uh, the city of Corioli, closes the gates behind him, uh, and he's trapped in the city, and Everyone said, well, that's it for him. He's dead. Uh, but he's such a great warrior uh, that he defends himself and gets the gates open. And then the Romans pour in and they conquer the city. That's how he gets the name Coriolanus for conquering the city. So he is the great warrior, just what Rome wants. Uh, and you do have to remember this is the world of hand-to-hand -hand combat and combat by swords. At one point, when he's uh, having trouble with the plebeians uh, and the patricians are worried about it, he says, on fair ground, I could beat 40 of them. And that's a boast, but not an empty boast. The implication in the play is that this man is of such physical strength and courage that the odds are pretty much 40 to 1. The, uh, he's got a 40 to 1 handicap. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, this is what Rome wants. And of course, he's rewarded, uh, he's nominated for consul. And this would be the normal procedure that a man like this would become consul. Uh, but uh, unfortunately for him, there's a, a, an electoral process in which he has to go in front of the plebeians uh, and get their endorsement uh, by twos and threes. And uh, uh, his greatness makes him too proud. When they ask him why he's there, what has brought you here? He says, mine own desert, not mine own desire. Uh, a little bit arrogant, and it, and the people still approve him, and then the tribunes uh, organize the people to get him uh, denied the consulship. And again, here's this man who who did everything Rome asked for him, uh, of him, and who won this great victory in some ways symbolically, single-handedly, and they banish him. And he turns around and says, I banish you. And he goes over to the Volskis, which in itself is a great daring thing. And he basically goes to their leader and he says, by all rights, you should kill me. Uh, I've killed all your people, but if you let me, I'll conquer Rome for you. Mm -hmm. And he leads the Volskian armies against Rome. 
and defeats them one after the other. And here's the interesting thing that Shakespeare suggests. This man makes a difference. When he leads the Roman armies, they win. When he leads the uh, Volscian armies, they win. It's much like Alcibiades, the Greek who went over from Athens to Sparta. And indeed, the source of all this is Plutarch's lives, where the life of Coriolanus is paired with the life of Alcibiades. So you can see what Shakespeare is focusing on. He really is concerned, again, about human agency. Are there men who make a difference? And Coriolanus is one of them. Uh, but he's tragic for the reason that he goes beyond the, you know, the normal range of humanity. They actually treat him like a god when he comes back from the victory at Corilli. The city is almost ready to turn itself over uh, to him. So uh, in, in, in some ways, Shakespeare exp explores the tragic situation of the great man in a community. And it's very interesting how it develops that uh, uh, you could, you know, Coriolanus' view of Rome, Rome, I can't live with it, I can't live without it. Rome has to save Coriolanus. Coriolanus can't live with him, can't live without him. That's the tragic situation that what makes this guy great in some ways makes him too big for the community. They're too dependent on him. He's too proud. Uh, and again, he's not the nicest guy in the book. Uh, but on the other hand, as I try to uh, point out to my students, he is heroic in the way, for example, Achilles is heroic. Uh, he is heroic in that ancient mold where what's fundamentally heroic is the great warrior, and that is what he is. Uh, all his problems come from trying to adjust to peacetime society. Shakespeare was fascinated by that subject. How does a great warrior uh, adjust to peacetime? It's the theme of Macbeth. It's the theme of Othello. It's a central theme in a number of the history plays, including Richard III. Uh, I think he saw it in his own lifetime with the great uh, Elizabethan captains like the Earl of Essex and Walter Raleigh, that they were very ambitious and militarily successful. And then they had a hard time putting themselves in the peacetime regime where they were in fact subordinate to a woman in the case of Elizabeth I, which made it even harder for them. And I think Shakespeare's experience of that uh, attracted him to this issue of, uh, uh, you know, it's the issue that in American politics would be Douglas MacArthur mm -hmm. or George Patton. Uh, and uh, again, when my students question, why are these Romans so impressed with military heroes? I say, George Washington, Andrew Jackson, Ulysses Grant, Dwight Eisenhower. I mean, uh, even yeah. in our relatively peaceful, democratic, middle-class regime, we've elected a lot of generals uh, to the highest office. So why wouldn't the Romans do it? And we have had these cases. I think MacArthur may be the most Coriolanus-like figure in our history, although the movie Patton, which is written by Francis Ford Coppola, I think is the most Shakespearean movie uh, of the modern world because it portrays a uh, Patton very much like a Coriolanus figure uh, and very hard to control, uh, and yet a great general. And so the, the Coriolanus story is partly about the Roman Republic, partly about the tension between, I guess, the truly great man and the Republic or, yeah, any, or yeah. any city, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, 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 and it... Uh, Shakespeare, I believe, you know, thinks of politics as tragic for this just this reason that it demands a certain character, especially from military leaders, which is not fully compatible with their peacetime uh, politics. And so again, the community uh, it can't live without Coriolanus. This is the person that stands in between them and being conquered by the Volskis, and yet it turns out they can't live with him either. Uh, in a weird way, it's kind of like a bad marriage. Can't live with him, can't right, live without right. him. And it's the same point. Uh, he, uh, he really wants to do everything alone, yet he is a general. He needs an army. And although he lasts for a couple of minutes alone in Corilli, if the Roman soldiers didn't come to back him up, uh, he would have been killed. And it's one of the har hardest things for him to deal with that he both despises the common people and yet needs them as a general. And so then 
we have we skip a few hundred years and get to Caesar, another great general. Uh, yeah, and, the, and here is where things change as a result of having an empire. Uh, that is, the um, uh, Machiavelli uh, makes this point, a number of analysts of Rome do, uh, that the turning point in Roman history was the prolongation of military commands. That is, uh, this formula consul, one-year term, by the time you've conquered Spain, it takes more than a year for your army to get there. Uh, and so the, the, the consulship system worked only when Rome was just conquering Italy, when they were marching effectively on neighbors. Uh, but, and, and, and this is typical of Rome. Uh, they didn't have a written constitution, and they were very practical and pragmatic, and they recognized the problem. And so essentially they created what we call the proconsul, uh, that you couldn't be a consul for more than a year, but if you were out uh, on the military range, uh, they would prolong your command and you'd in fact become proconsul in a territory. Uh, and that's a proconsul, you stand in the place of the consul. Uh, and uh, 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 now generals were ruling an army for five years, ten years, and they started to develop personal relationships uh, with the their troops. Uh, again, if your uh, consul system, your commander in chief changes every year, you're basically loyal to Rome, and the consul stands for Rome. Now. Uh, Julius Caesar was a great example of that. You're in Gaul for five, ten years with Julius Caesar. He's actually paying your salary. That's the other aspect of this. Uh, having an empire, they prolong the military commands. The, these great generals like Pompey and Caesar uh, develop personal loyalties. And they were enormously wealthy because they essentially had the taxes from these regions they conquered, which they then used to pay their armies. Crassus, who was another one of the first triumvirate, was Pompey, Julius Caesar, and Crassus. Crassus, who was legendarily the richest man in Rome, said, you ain't got money if you can't pay for an army. Mm -hmm. And I like to, in trying to, it's very hard to compare wealth over millennia, but I'd like to say uh, Bill Gates is rich, but he couldn't pay a fraction of the U.S military budget. And what you can say of these rich Roman patricians, essentially they paid the military budget out of their own pocket. Now, they were putting in that pocket all the wealth of right. Egypt or Gaul and so on. But you see what happens here. Uh, they're not only leading the army continuously for five years or so, they are paying the army uh, out of their own pockets and that develops the kind of loyalty. So of course the famous moment with Julius Caesar is crossing the Rubicon. Now what that meant, uh, the, the city of Rome was a sacred precinct. You could not bring your army into Rome. And the dividing line was this Rubicon River. You know, the obvious idea was you don't want an army sh showing up uh, under a potentially hostile general. And the great moment when you know Caesar seized his destiny uh, was he, he marched his army on Rome. No one thought he would do it. And when he did it, Rome was helpless. Uh, they, they had no defense. Uh, Pompey, who was his great rival, fled. And many of the senators fled the city. Pompey went to Greece where he had his army. Uh, and Caesar was actually able to claim Rome. Uh, but that's what you started happening. In the, in the last hundred years of the Republic, this didn't start with Julius Caesar, and Shakespeare doesn't show this, but you had a number of these generals uh, uh, who were essentially brokering their power in Rome by using these private armies, and th this is what subverted the Republic. The reason the Republic is so important to the United States is that uh, it developed the notion of checks and balances and separation of powers. This whole theory of preventing one man rule, you know, consul checks the other consul, the tribunes check the consul, and so on. And that system was undermined when you got a man like Caesar who was fabulously wealthy. Again, it's very hard for us to understand, but like he had all the income from France. Right. Uh, uh, and that, for example, meant grain. 
uh, the right to the grain, which he then distributed to the people. Uh, we talk about bread and circuses uh, as the policy of the emperors. It actually begins in the late Republic. Pompey built a theater. Before the Colosseum, the biggest theater in Rome was Pompey's theater, which is now an apartment building, uh, by the way, in Rome. Uh, uh, but uh, those imperial policies were begun by these giants of the late Republic, that they used their wealth, uh, free grain to everyone in Rome, staged gladiator games, so they became enormously popular, and that subverted the regime. Uh, many of the ancient accounts uh, including Plutarch, argued that it was wealth that corrupted uh, the uh, uh, Republic, that famously uh, these, uh, you know, again, we associate palaces with Rome. These Republican leaders didn't build palaces. All those palaces date from the uh, era of the empire. They actually lived rather frugal lives. They didn't dress in purple right. or sit on golden thrones. Uh, uh, most, the Republican leaders were, were, were leaders of the people in that sense. And uh, uh, becoming that wealthy led to problems. It was harder to check and balance that. So Caesar takes over is, is taking over and the and last gasp of the republic is the plot to is the plot to to assassinate him by people and like what do we learn from Shakespeare's play on that I mean what, what, what's the reflection on well the it's Republican a, empire I mean uh, you know the, the the most difficult question is whether Shakespeare thought the republic could be saved at that point uh, uh, I like to put the the question in these terms that it raised the issue, uh, do, do men make history or do hist does history make men? That is, the premise of Cassius is that men make history. And indeed, once they've killed Caesar, they run around the streets proclaiming freedom. And Cassius says, how many ages hence shall this our lofty scene be acted o'er in states unborn and accents uh, yet unknown, which is literally true uh, because it's actually, being it's being acted in front of us. They're saying, he's saying, we're gonna be really famous. We changed history. Plays are gonna be written out about us. We're gonna be seen as heroes. Uh, and yet, of course, it doesn't work. Uh, and we can talk about why it doesn't work, but just basically uh, uh, Shakespeare is wondering, could the Republic be restored? Uh, a lot of people, including Plutarch, claim at that point it was too corrupt. Uh, it couldn't be restored, that history had passed the Republican conspirators by. But it is interesting that Shakespeare shows them making a number of decisions and they're all wrong. And you have to say, if these decisions were wrong, if they made the right decisions, could they have saved the Republic? And it's very interesting in the pattern. In every single case, Cassius proposes the right thing, and Brutus overrules him with the wrong thing. And Brutus is a more impressive, not impressive person, but a more... Has the better reputation. Better indeed. reputation, yeah, yeah. Say, The interesting thing that Shakespeare shows, so about, a, right? shows yeah. about a conspiracy, and again, and I believe that Shakespeare had read Machiavelli's discourses. In, in any case, uh, he seems to understand conspiracies, that they are a combination of the high and the low. Cassius is envious of Caesar, and he's open about it, and that's when Caesar says, Jan Cassius has a lean and hungry look. And you do need somebody like that in conspiracy. Cassius initiates it. Uh, Brutus on his own would never have done this. But Cassius knows he needs Brutus because of Brutus's reputation for being honorable. And Brutus is a lineal descendant of the Junius Brutus, who led the rebellion against the Tarquins and established the Republic. And that's presented as a fact within the play. And if you want to restore the Republic, who's better than the descendant of the guy that uh, founded it? Uh, and uh, the the conspiracy needs the low-mindedness of Cassius right. and the high-mindedness of Brutus. The problem is that Cassius himself is in awe of Brutus, doesn't want to lose, uh, lose him in the conspiracy, and in some ways is just willing to listen to him as this famous... Roman. So that, for example, one of the things, uh, I mean, obviously the mistake they make is they don't kill Mark Antony. 
and that's Brutus overruling Cassius. Of course, will seem too bloody. But one of the decisions they make, Cassius proposes Cicero. Let's get Cicero part of the conspiracy. And Brutus nixes it. No Cicero. Now, Cicero was the greatest orator in Rome. As we know from the great scene with Brutus and Antony speaking at Caesar's funeral, ultimately the conspiracy fails because of a great speech Antony gave. If they'd had Cicero on their side, uh, in fact, he was a specialist in attacking Antony. There's a famous series of speeches he gave called the Philippics, modeled on Demosthenes' speeches in Athens against Philip of Macedon, and these were a set of speeches viciously attacking Mark Antony. He could have handled uh, Mark Antony. It's interesting, uh, the only reason uh, Brutus gives for not having Cicero uh, join them is he never joined something he didn't start. Uh, now, it would have been easy enough for Cassius mm. to convince Cicero that he came up with the idea of conspiracy. Clearly, Brutus doesn't want to share the conspiracy mm. with anyone who is as famous as he is. Cassius isn't. None of the other conspirators are. So, you, uh, again, when I was taught this in junior high, uh, we were taught that Cassius was all evil and Brutus was all good. Right. And that Shakespeare doesn't work that way. He's able to see the two sides of... Uh, any character, and even the great and noble Brutus, uh, who isn't doing this out of self-interest, has a certain kind of self-interest uh, in it that he wants to be known as the leader of the conspiracy. And a certain philosophic view, almost, doesn't Brutus have? Not a philosophic view, but a well, kind of, he is. Uh, a st that's another interesting issue about the play that I really only discovered in writing this book. That is. When we get to it, we'll see that in Antony and Cleopatra, Rome gets Egyptianized. Yeah, because well, it's we'll conquered. Talk, we'll talk about that now, but uh, yeah, we'll uh, say yeah, we're yeah, But I'm just, and what I didn't realize in Julius Caesar, Rome is Hellenized. Uh, there's the famous line when uh, Casca, one of the conspirators, is explaining <coughs> uh, that scene where Antony stages a. Uh, uh, the crown business, Caesar, yeah. uh, the, it's a kind of trial balloon, will the people accept a king? Uh, uh, and Casca says, well, uh, 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 Cassius says, well, what did Cicero say? He's really sounding him out. And uh, turns out, tis Greek to me, Cicero spoke in Greek, Casca says. And Casca says, I can't tell you because I don't know Greek. By the way, historically, in the sources, Casca knows Greek. So Shakespeare's emphasizing this. Uh, and it is a very odd moment when you think about it. I mean, obviously what's going on is uh, a form of esotericism that uh, uh, Cicero doesn't want people to hear him saying nasty things about uh, Caesar. So he says it in Greek to his friends. Uh, Cicero, also a great transmitter of Greek philosophy. Yes, and, it, so. and a, in some ways, a, you know, a follower of Plato, an a academic. Uh, and it suddenly dawned on me, Shakespeare is saying something about the Rome of 50 B.C. compared to the Rome of 500 B.C. Nobody speaks Greek right. in Coriolanus. In fact, Coriolanus, when he's arguing <coughs> against the plebeians, says, we don't want to do what they do in Greece. In Greece, they give grain free because uh, they're democracy, but we're an aristocracy. <coughs> he has nothing but contempt for the Greeks. Uh, uh, but, uh, and then, you know, I was reading uh, Roman history, and in fact, uh, Rome was Hellenized by its encounter with the Greeks. Again, the Rome we picture Colosseum, Pantheon, is a heavily Hellenized Rome after they've conquered Greece and brought back painters, sculptors, architects from Greeks. The architects of the Pantheon were two Greeks. And so, uh, But the Rome that precedes it, of which we have almost no remains, <coughs> would look so un-Roman to us because right. it was un-Greek. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, when you start to look around the Rome of Julius Caesar, uh, there are all these Greek influences. Cassius is an Epicurean. So Brutus is a Stoic. There's a cynic that interrupts Brutus and Cassius when they're arguing. Uh, and and uh, again, uh, uh, Cicero was a skeptic or an academic skeptic. 
He has a very brief scene, only about 10 lines. What he does in that scene is express skepticism about the Roman gods. There's a huge storm, and Casca is afraid. The gods are punishing us. And Casca says, don't tell me it's natural. (laughs) And Cicero says, it is. Uh, He says, men misconstrue things after their own fashion, missing the things themselves or something like that. He basically is saying, those aren't, that's not, the gods don't speak to us in thunder, it's just thunder. It's two clouds colliding, uh, as, as even the Greeks understood. And it did dawn on me, you, you see, this is an aspect of how a republic is corrupted by its foreign conquests. Uh, and a surprising number of the patricians objected to Roman imperialism. They said, stop conquering all these foreign lands. Uh, It's going to come back to bite us. Cato the Elder is a great example of that, who said, these Greeks are going to destroy us with their Greeky ways. Uh, uh, And it's quite remarkable that, you know, Coriolanus, there isn't anything close to philosophy in that city. And you can say, I I like to say that uh, uh, Shakespeare's, these plays are tragic, because they're showing us trade-offs. The Roman Republic is a war machine, and it was impressive that it conquered everybody. And even if they were defeated, they bounced back, and no no one ever defeated them for good. Uh, And that impressed uh, people. But it's narrowly focused on war. And there are no philosophers in the Rome of Coriolanus. They're not sending their children to study philosophy. In fact, it's said of Coriolanus' son, Martius, he'd rather hear the drum than listen to his schoolmaster. And the Roman education is purely military in the early Republic. But in fact, by Caesar's time, Romans were sending their children to Athens. Ovid's parents wanted him to be a lawyer. So they sent him to Athens to learn rhetoric. Uh, Unfortunately, he learned poetry, disappointed mom and dad, used his law degree to write poetry, Mm -hmm. eventually got banished from Rome by Augustus for his his lewd uh, and lascivious poetry. but. In some ways, it's a great thing. So, you know, it's philosophy now. Yeah, and, culture, you know, this yeah. is really culture, yeah. Uh, and yet, they're paying a price for it. And what I did, you know, people had noticed that Brutus is a Stoic and Cassius is an Epicurean. Alan Bloom has that great essay, Shakespeare's Politics, on uh, Julius Caesar, the morality of the pagan hero, which I have to give credit to. It started me on my analysis of these plays. And he pointed to the fact, actually, Brutus and Cassius are the only characters in all of Shakespeare who are uh, patrons of a named philosophy, you know, who, who call themselves Epicureans and, and Stoics. And yet I notice every one of the philosophies is apolitical. Skepticism, cynicism, Epicureanism, Stoicism. Uh, they all recommend retirement in one form or another from political life. Uh, even Stoicism, uh, which was the philosophy most compatible right. with the uh, uh, public life, but nevertheless, and of course Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor, most famous Stoic, and many people equate Romanism with Stoicism, but Coriolanus is no Stoic, right. and Stoicism was fairly late, I think it begins in the third century BC, it's a Greek phenomenon, obviously Epicureanism is Greek uh, as well, and they were reactions already to the corruption of political life the recommendation of Epicurus was retire to your farm. Right. Give a, and uh, uh, even Aurelius, you know, that's uh, third century AD, uh, he said, if you're emperor, be the best emperor you can be. But if you're a slave, be the best slave you can be. In other words, uh, whatever position you're in, you should be content with it. You don't want, you don't, striving is the worst thing possible. The great Stoic principle is, be happy with the, what you've got, and you'll always be happy. Uh, uh, and so it's, in many ways, it's, it's an entirely un-Republican philosophy. The Republican Romans were not stoic. They were very ambitious and striving to get as much as uh, they could. And actually, it turns out that the Epicureanism and Stoicism uh, of 
uh, uh, Cassius Bruce are only skin deep. Right. Uh, they profess it, but they don't really believe it because if they did, they wouldn't be complaining about Julius Caesar. Yes, they're more uh, Republican, yeah. Yeah, it, they are really Republicans and deeply political. An Epicurean would say it's not worth wasting your energy on politics. You got a nice farm, go back there and enjoy it. And a Stoic would, you know, say, I'm Brutus, I'm reasonably well honored in this community, that's enough, what do I care? But does it distort their political judgments in the sense that they can't quite come to grips with yes. what's necessary politically because yeah, they have this yeah. high flown? <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, 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 it, 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 uh, it leads them to, to make mistakes. Uh, actually, in Cassius's case, it's, uh, at the end of the play, when they're starting to lose, uh, uh, Cassius says, I always did uh, hold Epicurus strong, but now I partly believe in things that do presage. And he's seen a bad omen with birds, and he starts to get pessimistic on this uh, he actually loses the uh, battle uh, mistakenly when he thinks one of his friends has been taken by the Romans, by, by the other side, the forces of Octavius. And then he, it turns out uh, he's actually being embraced by his own troops. Cassius kills himself in despair. And partly he says, well, this is my birthday. Might as well be my death day which is a very superstitious thing to be saying. So Cash, if Cassius had remained true to his Epicureanism, yeah, he might have been okay. But Brutus, his stoicism makes him fatalistic. And there is that famous speech, there's a tie in the affairs of men, which leads him to make, once again, the wrong military decision. Uh, uh, Cassius was a Fabian. He wanted the Fabian strategy that they used against Hannibal. Withdraw, uh, don't engage them, uh, let them have to live off the land, they'll run out of food. And, so, uh, and Bruce says, no, we gotta fight him because there's a tide in the affairs of men and that turns out to be the wrong decision. We know that because it's what Octavius and Antony were hoping for. They say they've got the high ground, we'll never be able, uh, if only they'd come down and attack us, and that's what they do. And of course, the weirdest thing in the play that Shakespeare uh, shows is this famous double revelation of Portia's death. It's in Act Four, Cassius and Brutus are quarreling, uh, and Brutus uh, is unusually testy and getting angry at Cassius, and he, he asks why, uh, and he finally says, Portia's dead. He's abandoned his wife, and she's killed herself. Uh, and Cash said, oh, why, did you, why did you tell me now I understand? And he begins by saying, of your philosophy you make no use if you give way to accidental evils. That's stoicism. Evils are just accidents. They don't go to the essence. Doesn't matter if your wife dies. Doesn't matter if your children uh, die. I mean, stoicism is a pretty inhuman philosophy. And anyway, we get this scene where uh, Brutus frankly admits that uh, I'm, uh, I'm upset despite my stoicism. And then the weirdest thing happens, about 20 or 30 lines later, uh, it's a public scene and messengers have arrived from Rome to their army camp and this character is hesitating to say something and Brutus says, come on, give me the news from Rome. And he says, okay, if you have to know, Portia's dead and by strange manner. And Brutus acts like he's never heard of this. And he says, she's gone, but uh, we all must die. And knowing that, I'm not upset. And, and Cash just says, wow, you're incredibly impressive how stoic you are. And you know, this is so weird uh, that many uh, Shakespeare scholars posit an error in the text here. They say Shakespeare wrote two, two versions. And uh, the guy typesetting from the manuscript didn't see that Shakespeare had crossed out one of them. And there's, there's this effort to attribute it to some kind of error. But when you think about it, Shakespeare's showing something very important about Brutus, that the Stoicism is a public act. Yeah. It is an act for public consumption, and it's one of the problems with Brutus. He is noble, I don't want to question that but he's a little less noble than he pretends to be. 
and uh, again, I should say a lot of people agree with me on this. Uh, the opinions sort of split 50-50, whether it's a textual error or Shakespeare showing us something about uh, Bruce. I noticed something that I'm proud that I don't think anyone else has noticed, and I'll say it again. Portia's dead and by strange means. Yeah, what does that mean? If a husband hears that, doesn't he ask how'd yeah. she die? Yeah. We know from proceeding in the scene that he knows she died by swallowing red hot coals. The reason he doesn't ask yeah. is because he knows, but it's glaring that he doesn't ask. I, I saw a cheesy detective story where the detective figured out the husband was the murderer because he didn't ask the details of the murder and supposedly didn't know them. Right. And that, that helped me understand the scene in Shakespeare. So yes, one of the interesting things is uh, in Julius Caesar you would think that it's good that philosophy comes to Rome, but in many ways it's a sign of the corruption of the regime that the focus on politics is weakening. And Antony and Cleopatra, I want to and ask about the, all three of them as ancient plays, but let's just, there's yeah, a big well, change. So Anthony Cleopatra yes, is... Yes, yeah, and uh, this is, uh, again, it's early, it's before the official empire. I mean, August, he's still Octavius Caesar, he doesn't get the title Augustus till several years after the play ends. But in fact, you see yeah. the one-man rule emerging. We got a second triumvirate. Uh, now Octavius and Lepidus and Antony have gotten together to rule as three. But three become two, and two becomes one. Uh, they eliminate Lepidus first, and then Antony and uh, Octavius duke it out, and uh, the last man standing is emperor. Uh, and. Uh, you see the consequences everywhere in the play, uh, and as I put, people have now become subjects rather than citizens. Uh, one of the conspicuous things in the play, conspicuous by its absence, is the plebeians. Uh, Coriolanus opens with a big scene with the plebeians. Julius Caesar opens with a big scene with the plebeians. The crisis of Julius Caesar occurs in the third act when the plebeians essentially decide the fate of Rome, whether they side with Brutus or side with uh, Mark Antony. Uh, and as I like to put it, the plebeians vote themselves out of history in Act Three of Julius Caesar. In effect, they choose Antony and they never appear. Uh, I don't know that anyone's actually spotted that before, but Acts four and five of Julius Caesar and the whole of Antony Cleopatra, no plebeian ever appears on stage. They are mentioned twice uh, in Antony Cleopatra, but as spectators. Cleopatra is worried that Octavius will stage plays about her as a whore. She says uh, some actor will boy uh, uh, my greatness in the posture of a whore. And of course, the joke there is they only had boy act. A boy actor would have been playing Cleopatra on Shakespeare's stage. And that, in a way, encapsulates the whole thing that the plebeians no longer participate in history, they become spectators to it. And in general, uh, everyone in Antony and Cleopatra is just watching history unfold, and there really is a s sense now that history makes men. Antony complains about Julius Caesar that he never, uh, excuse me, Octavius Caesar, that he never won his battles in person. It was always his lieutenants that won them. And at one point he says, a child could win with this kind of Roman army. Uh, and the sense is that the armies become this machine, and Octavia, Julius Caesar was a great battlefield commander. Octavius was not. And there's this sense in the play now, again, that human agency is gone. There are these broader uh, tides in human history that now uh, come into effect, uh, and that uh, Octavius is, is not a hero anymore. And Antony. Retire, retires, but chooses private life or well, he erotic actually, life, I guess. Yeah, well, say, the interesting or, or thing seduced, is, I mean, I mean, yeah, well, he, he chooses a very public erotic life. Right. In the middle of the play, uh, he asked to live a private man in Athens, 
which has a lot of symbolic force when you think about it. And in fact, the historical Antony loved Athens. He loved the theater there. Uh, this is all in Plutarch, and so Shakespeare was aware of it. Uh, but in fact, he could live a private life anytime he cho chose, but no, he wants a new form of publicity. He still wants to be famous. He still wants to be the noblest Roman of the all, all, but now as what we would call a celebrity, as a celebrity lover. At the beginning of the play, uh, in the very first scene, uh, he's with Cleopatra in Alexandria, uh, and he, he says, kingdoms are clay, politics is nasty, it's not more. And he says that the nobleness of life is to do death, and he gives Cleopatra a big kiss. And he's redefining nobility now so that it is a, it's for being a great lover. And he ends the speech by saying, uh, uh, on which I bind on pain of punishment, the world to wheat, we stand up peerless. Many people think he's given up politics for love. He's actually redefining love as the new form of political preeminence, and he's issued a law hmm. on which I bind on pain of punishment the world to acknowledge we're the greatest. Uh, and that's the, it's a curiously modern world in Antony Cleopatra. It is a world of celebrity. It's like these movie stars who say, I want to be alone right. and get rid of these paparazzi. You leave them alone, mm -hmm. they go crazy and they want the flash bulbs popping. And Antony Cleopatra, uh, they don't want private life. They want this new form of public life where they will be famous for being the greatest lovers in the world. In that sense, uh, it's, it's not a diversion from politics to love. Love becomes the new form of politics. And, and that's what happens in the empire, that you don't want to encourage the old military virtues, the old ambitions, the old aggressiveness. The famous speech about that is when Julius Caesar says, Jan Cassius has a lean and hungry look to Antony, and says, Antonius, let me have men about me that are fat. He wants people who indulge their bodies, uh, <clears throat> who aren't, you know, like Cassius. They're lean and hungry. They're, 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 they're ambitious. They're a threat to him. And you really see articulated there the imperial policy, again, connected to this idea of bread and circuses. And, uh, you want people who now have no ambition because they have no goal for their ambition to find enjoyment and maybe some other way of becoming famous as Andy and Cleopatra do. And we don't have, I suppose, a subsequent play on the transition of Rome from pagan Rome to Christian Rome. No, but it's... Shakespeare is something, something Shakespeare was quite uh, it, aware it, of and thought I, a lot I about. I believe it is, it's implied in Andy and Cleopatra. It's in some ways... Uh, the subtlest aspect of the play that there are a number of references that indicate that these events are roughly contemporaneous with the rise of uh, Christianity. For example, Herod of Jewry is mentioned five times in the play, three of which are in the source in Plutarch, but still, why is Shakespeare mentioning Herod of Jewry right. uh, uh, so many times? Uh, uh, there are uh, are a number of quotes from the book of Revelation uh, in the play. Almost the opening lines uh, uh, for Anne and Cleopatra, she, she says, uh, uh, I'll set a born how far to be beloved. And Anne says, then now needs must find out new heaven, new earth. Uh, and, uh, uh, so it sort of anticipates a kind of otherworldly uh, yes, uh, love the, transcending. Yes, exactly. This world that, and so forth. that the old Roman world was finite. Uh, it had very clear this worldly goals. You can argue that was the power of the Republic. Shakespeare is very careful to suppress any references to the afterlife. Uh, in either Coriolanus or Julius Caesar. In fact, he omits one that's in Plutarch. Uh, uh, I have a whole essay on that in this book. Uh, and uh, he uh, uh, shows the one form of immortality in the Republic is fame. That's the highest goal people have. Win battles for the city, you'll get an epic poem written about you, you'll be famous. Uh, 
that goal has been lost in part because Rome has conquered the world. It's very po powerful in Antony and Cleopatra that in Alexander, the great sense, there are no more worlds to conquer. Uh, they've defeated their last enemy, the Parthians, uh, and kind of all the pieces are in place. Now again, Rome went on to conquer Britain and the first century AD, there were some additional uh, conquests, uh, but uh, no longer with the sense we're in a life and death battle with the Carthaginians, right. for example. Uh, so many of the old goals are, are gone, and so people have new goals, uh, and Shakespeare is just indicating on the margins what's coming along the line. I mean, because by 330 uh, A.D., Constantine converts to Christianity and converts the whole empire. One, I mean, again, these things are really buried, but I'll just mention uh, 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 Antony at one point refers to the bulls of Bassan out of nowhere and thank heavens for footnotes that's a reference to the 22nd Psalm and uh, I know we all know the 23rd Psalm by right, heart right. but I bet you don't know the 22nd Psalm you wouldn't run it with that bet right uh, it begins much to my embarrassment it but, yeah. begins with these words my God my God why hast thou forsaken oh, me <laughs> Uh, which is better known yes. from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Uh, and it is one of those examples where Jesus fulfills an Old Testament prophecy by quoting those lines. And how weird to have Mark Antony quote the 22nd Psalm as Jesus did. And I, you know, again, this is much debated, but again, I have a lot of people on my side on this. There is a scene, Antony's Last Supper, before uh, his battle with Octavius, has a lot of overtones of the Last Supper. In fact, he is so downbeat that Cleopatra is asking, what are you doing? And uh, his uh, uh, lieutenant in a barber says, to make his followers weep. And he's, all he's talking about is losing the next day. And uh, don't, when I'm gone, don't forget me. And so again, I, I'm not saying, as some people have argued that Antony is somehow a portrait of Jesus, but it is a reminder of forces that were at work uh, in the Rome of last decades BC, first decades AD, that among other things, produced Christianity. You know, Rome, the religion of Mithra, for example, was very powerful, right. especially the Roman soldiers. They have found a Mithraeum in London. Uh, there's a great one in Rome. If yeah. you go to Basilica San Clemente, you go down to the, uh, what's a first century apartment building, and there's a Mithraeum. Who knows, Rome could have gone over to Mithraism. Uh, 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 there was a tremendous Egyptian cult in Rome. Uh, the goddess Isis is mentioned several times in Antony and Cleopatra. When Julius Caesar brought Cleopatra back in triumph to Rome, Cleomania swept the city. If you go to Pompeii, there's a temple of Isis there, right in the middle of downtown Pompeii, next to the uh, uh, amphitheater, uh, and the wall paintings from it are in the Naples Archaeological uh, uh, Museum. So the, something was happening, and again, it's the logic of a late, emp a late republic with its empire. Uh, Coriolanus was never exposed to foreign deities. Mm -hmm. He never got to Egypt. Uh, he was lucky if he got to Antium, you know, 12 miles down the road. But now, uh, Roman tourism is big. Uh, in Antony and Cleopatra, they're all talking about the pyramids and crocodiles, and uh, the Romans were in fact fascinated with Egypt, and Shakespeare shows that, and the Egyptianization of Rome in, in what is essentially the headquarters of the Roman navy at Mycenaeum. There's a party in the play, and they dance the Egyptian Bacchanals. Uh, and that's doubly foreign. It's Bacchus, it's Greek, the Bacchanals, and it's Egyptian. And uh, they say this ripens towards an Alexandrian feast. Uh, and but you know, by the way, this Roman play opens in Alexandria, obviously a city founded by Alexander the Great. Uh, Shakespeare doesn't 
talk about this, but one of uh, Octavius's charges against Antony was that he planned on moving the empire to Alexandria. Mm. Uh, there's some evidence for that, and of course, ultimately, Constantine moved the capital to what's now Istanbul, uh, and which he then modestly named Constantinople for himself. But one of the effects of the imperial expansion under the Republic was to shift the center of gravity, Rome, eastward. Uh, Ephesus, I think, which is on the west coast of Turkey, I think was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. Uh, 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 a great deal of the commerce moved eastward. And again, that's why the Roman emperors eventually recognized that the center of the empire was considerably east of, uh, east of Rome. So Shakespeare shows that, that uh, again, these consequences of expanding and expanding and therefore expanding the horizons of your people so they're no longer so clearly focused on Rome. And so there's a kind of cosmopolitanism and but maybe a more humanly interesting. Yes, I mean, I think that's well, right? another one of I these mean, examples Anthony of. Cleopatra tr are very tr yes. I mean, I, uh, I usually end my discussion with my students, you know, which would you rather live in, the Rome of Coriolanus or the Rome of Antony Cleopatra? And uh, it's 99% will, of course, say the land of Antony Cleopatra, which is uh, so much more similar to our globalized world. Coriolanus, the world of Coriolanus is boring unless you're really into military victories. If you are, it's preferable. And I usually can get them to understand at least why, if you don't personally prefer it, you can recognize someone would. And also the civic spirit, which is yes. impressive. And we'd, uh, yeah, and we'd that, like to have some of that. Yes, uh, uh, and that uh, that is why you know the classical Republican tradition has been so important. It maintains the importance of civic virtue. Uh, there's one uh, uh, critic who uh, you know, criticized my first book uh, for seeming to prefer the Republic uh, to the Empire by quoting Gibbon, the famous line that uh, probably the best time to live in the world was the second century AD under the good emperors. And you know, my reaction to that is that's a real academic's view of the world. Yeah, right. uh, it is, sh first of all, you're assuming you're not a slave, uh, but also you assume you'll live the good life among the elite. Right. That's really what Gibbon had in mind, that it was a great time to be a scholar. Uh, uh, but what if you think uh, winning military victories is great? Uh, and what if you think participating actively in politics is great? Uh, and indeed, it's a purely material view. Uh, I found uh, f for the book a really great quote from Baudin, Jean Baudin, the French political theorist, just about a generation before Shakespeare, uh, where uh, uh, he talks about the fact that the Roman Empire may have been richer and materially better off, but there was no soul to it. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, he posits the best time was in the third century BC uh, uh, under the Republic. And it really is a question that was very important to earlier thinkers. Rousseau, for example, in the first discourse, celebrates the spirit of the Roman Republic against modern cosmopolitanism. And that's why it's important to keep alive the classical Republican tradition, uh, which put its great uh, emphasis on virtue, what it was to be part civic virtue, what it was to participate uh, in the community and do things for the public good. Because what drops out in Antony and Cleopatra is any sense of the good of Rome anymore. Uh, it's almost a mafia-like world where people are just out to get what they uh, can for themselves. Nietzsche features in this book quite a lot. Say a word about that. Okay, this is uh, again a bit of a historical accident that uh, I, I read too much as a kid. Uh, I was a child tragedy. Uh, so as I was first studying these plays seriously in high school, I was also reading Nietzsche. And what I did notice is that uh, Nietzsche's theory of the difference between what he called mass morality and slave morality 
is very close uh, to what Shakespeare presents in these plays, which isn't so surprising. Nietzsche was a great classical scholar, and he was studying this material from the point of view of Homer. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Nietzsche's famous distinction between good and evil and good and bad, uh, which you find in Beyond Good and Evil in the, his book, The Genealogy of, of Morals, uh, he sees the ancient ethics uh, as being that of a warrior people where the fundamental virtue is strength. And indeed in Coriolanus, in a big public speech on behalf of Coriolanus, uh, one of the consuls says, it is held that valor is the chiefest virtue. I always say to my students, could any politician say that in public right. in the United States? Well, what a firestorm that would set off. And I think Shakespeare was drawn to the subject matter according to this. So he wanted to see what is a community like when valor is the chiefest virtue. And Nietzsche's idea is the masters, the aristocrats, the superior warriors, define themselves in terms of a whole series of virtues, strength, uh, health, uh, honesty, and what they then see as bad is everything that's the opposite. So essentially, the uh, value standard strength versus weakness. And this is the standard of uh, warrior culture. It's what you see in the Iliad, for example. It what, it's what makes someone a hero. Is he strong? And Nietzsche's very controversial, but I think very insightful theory is that uh, Christianity, Christian ethics revol uh, results from an inversion of this. Uh, that the Christians take what the uh, ancient pagans thought of as uh, good and they make that evil, and they take what they thought of, uh, the ancients thought of as bad, and make that good. By which I mean this, uh, the greatest evil, the greatest sin uh, for Christians is pride and in general aggressiveness and the definition of evil is the behavior of warriors and what the warriors looked upon as a vice uh, now is elevated to the virtue, meekness, humility, uh, uh, as I like to put it in the, in the ancient world, it was the Greek shall inherit the earth. For the Christians, it was the meek shall inherit the earth. When you teach, you have to come up it's with good. slogans it's like good. this yeah, yeah. Uh, to make it stick. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and, and Shakespeare shows that. Uh, he hadn't read Nietzsche, though this is in Machiavelli. Right. Machiavelli's discourse. And was Nietzsche, didn't, had Nietzsche read Shakespeare much? He had, Shakespeare but... Shakespeare's popular in Germany, right? Yes, yes, I mean, this is amazing. Nietzsche studied Julius Caesar in high school, like go. every one of us, <laughs> and we have his high school essay on Julius Caesar. Is that uh, right? Yes, you can read it. And it's all about the friendship of Brutus and Cassius. It's all about friendship. Uh, he... Uh, uh, there is no evidence that he read Coriolanus and Antony and Cleopatra. Uh, there is, uh, he mentions 18 of the plays. We know that he read 18 of the plays. And, you know, we got letters and car uh, uh, conversations. Uh, he played the part of Hotspur in Henry IV at his high school. Can you imagine that? Uh, no. <laughs> Nietzsche <laughs> playing the part of Hotspur. I mean, uh, and according to his friend, he overacted. Uh, that I can but, imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah I just, it was so strange to discover this uh, uh, in researching it. That it, So, um, uh, I, I, some, I don't think Shakespeare understood the Roman, uh, <laughs> don't think Nietzsche understood the Roman plays. There were no signs. Yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, he was interested in them for other reasons. I don't, he really was interested in the theme of friendship in them. And so that, for example, the quarrel between uh, Brutus and Cassius, he discussed as if it was the quarrel between him and Richard Wagner. Uh, he really projected himself in the play. Uh, he did. He did know Shakespeare. Uh, his sister said, "It's Shakespeare that drove him to the idea of the Superman." Uh, uh, and, and there's evidence that reading Byron and Schiller and Shakespeare. 
uh, broke him out of middle class morality. His aunt Rosalie, Nietzsche had an aunt Rosalie, gave him a set of Shakespeare for his 16th birthday. In and German or in English? As I think it was in German because okay. there were great Schlegel Teak translations. I believe uh, he read Shakespeare in German. Uh, uh, and it produced Nietzsche. Yeah, <laughs> it's, that's uh, it, it's very strange. I mean, his, uh, his family was very upset with what happened from him from reading Nietzsche, I, from reading Shakespeare. Uh, so I do, I, I, I feel that, uh, well, it's interesting. Uh, uh, Shakespeare, uh, Nietzsche bought into the Goethe idea that Shakespeare's Romans are Englishmen. He says that in Untimely Meditations and also in some of the notes he wrote. So I think that's where he went wrong. He, he didn't, didn't realize, take it, serious enough, yeah. take it serious enough that this was a portrait of the ancient world. But uh, what I'm saying is I think Shakespeare and Nietzsche uh, came together on this point uh, and so that, for example, at the very end of Antony Cleopatra, Octavius says, seeing Cleopatra's death, O oh, noble weakness. And that's Nietzsche in a no nutshell there. Yeah. How has weakness become noble? And there are many, well, even you know, Anthony saying the nobleness of life is due thus. There are many moments in Anthony and Cleopatra where uh, the Romans are redefining nobility in what Nietzsche would call a Christian direction, that now weakness has become strength, and so on. And here's the interesting point that, this is what I do discuss in this long chapter uh, 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 on Nietzsche and Shakespeare. I think they have a disagreement. Uh, uh, Nietzsche, at least in his last work, The Antichrist, claims that Christianity destroyed an otherwise uncorrupted Roman Empire. And he goes on, the Roman Empire is going to last for a thousand years. Uh, it was built to last a thousand years. And then these Christians came along uh, and ruined it. Uh, Shakespeare shows something very different. It was the corruption of the Roman aristocracy that led to a lot of things, one of which was Christianity, that uh, the change in people like Antony was necessary. Uh, uh, and indeed, it's a real question in Nietzsche, if the Roman Empire was so strong, how did it get overthrown by these weak people? And in fact, again, what I discovered in researching this essay, there are all sorts of notes you know, Nietzsche left behind this knocklos, as it's called, uh, all these notes. And in those notes, he discusses the corruption of the Roman Empire. He, he, he hated Christianity so much uh, that he wanted to claim there was nothing wrong with the Roman Empire. But his notes, for example, there's one really key note where he says, once they saw Nero up on the throne, the idea that some men are by nature better than the others, or better than others, were shot. Uh, uh, the, the, the claim to nobility was undermined by the corruption of the Roman Empire. Uh, uh, and there's lots of notes to that effect. Uh, so I think Shakespeare's correcting Nietzsche possibly actually correcting Machiavelli, uh -huh. who leans towards this Nietzschean position. Uh, uh, what Shakespeare shows, and I think it, in some ways it is the most remarkable uh, contribution of the Roman plays, and why he is such an important analyst of Rome is that he sees uh, the corruption of the nobility, the political corruption, the corruption by wealth, the sense uh, of defeatism. Uh, uh, Antony and Cleopatra is pervaded by defeatism. And actually, again, Shakespeare shows it already at the end of Julius Caesar. Brutus has lost everything, and largely through his own fault. And he says, I shall have, this is this is just about to commit suicide. He sh says, I shall have more glory by this losing day than Antony and Octavius will by winning by their, uh, uh, what is it, a vile victory, I think he called it, vile conquest, he says. That's a real transformation in Roman spirit. 
uh, Coriolanus and nobody in this play goes around saying, I'm going to have more glory by losing. Right, right. Uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and the notion that conquest is vile, that's exactly this uh, revaluation of Roman values uh, that Nietzsche speaks about. But Shakespeare shows it was happening in the Roman nobility as a result uh, of the uh, really corruption of the aristocracy. And many Roman historians, uh, st Ronald Syme, for example, the great book on the Roman Revolution, on the transition from the Republic to the Empire, points out the dispiriting of the Roman nobility. Yeah. And um, these were people who were used to having their lives in their control and having triumphs in their name and glory, and suddenly they were courtiers. Yeah. Let, let me ask you maybe one last question. This is very speculative and sort of too simple and big, but I mean, to what degree is, so Shakespeare's trying to show you sort of this, I don't know, soul of the Roman world, the uh, two different souls, maybe the Republican and the imperial one, the, Pagan, so that's very important. And he deals so subtly with Christianity in so many of the plays, Hamlet and stuff, you know, and its effect on politics. How much of this is sort of a world that has gone away and somehow it's useful for us to see as students of human nature? And how much does Shakespeare want to revive somehow aspects of, let's say, the ancient world? And, and no, I think, uh, I mean, what was the Renaissance? if not the revival of classical antiquity. That's what we, that was Burkhardt's thesis about it. I mean, that's the renaissance in renaissance, the rebirth. Uh, and you know, the great emblem of it is digging up these Roman statues. They hadn't seen a naked statue in 1500 years. And the shock of, uh, you know, the, there's the, um, uh, 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 what was it, the, uh, 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 oh, the Barberini Fawn. Uh, uh, it's in the Glyptotech in Munich. Yeah. Uh, it's just an astonishing naked figure from the ancient world. Michelangelo was there in a minute when it was discovered and may have retouched parts of it. And that's where Michelangelo's figures come from. Is that if you've never seen the Barbary uh, font, go to Munich. I mean, it's breathtaking. I mean, uh, you can just watch, particularly women, walk into that room and just awestruck by this. And that's you know, this is something that had, the, the the naked human form had not been celebrated uh, in the Middle Ages. Tullio Lombardo is famous for that atom that's in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and which the, they accidentally let break and they just put it back together. But that's the first great monumental nude in the late Middle Ages, culminating in Michelangelo's David. I mean, those are emblematic of trying to revive an ancient view of the world that had been lost in the Christian Middle Ages. I like that because it's a very good way of visualizing it. But, you know, Machiavelli's discourses on the first 10 books of Livy, it's an attempt to revive, uh, restate and revive the principles of ancient republicanism. And it was happening in Florence, Venice, uh, for the first time since antiquity, the attempt to revive civic republics. Uh, and I think Shakespeare was part of that larger movement that his Roman plays are one of the great examples of the revival of classical antiquity. I think he's had a huge long-term effect in bringing back these ideas which were threatened to being lost. Uh, and you know, so much had to do with the uh, Ottoman conquest of Constantinople and all those Greek scholars fleeing west with the Iliad. The Iliad had been lost in the Middle Ages, uh, and it was just coming back in Shakespeare's lifetime. Chapman started translating the Iliad, and Shakespeare was influenced by that. So yes, I think he turned to this material uh, 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 with the view that this was an aspect of human nature that had been lost sight of. Not totally. You're never going to lose sight of military virtue. There were the Crusades, after all. Uh, but uh, I think, particularly Coriolanus, he want to say, what's a pagan community like? What is it like 
to have a community based on the principle that valor is the chiefest virtue. And the results are problematic. On the one hand, they're very impressive, and it certainly struck people uh, in the Renaissance that Rome had conquered the entire Mediterranean world. And they couldn't equal uh, Roman achievements for a long time. I right. mean, the, the point of the Duomo in Florence was finally to build a dome larger than the Pantheon. And it took them over 100 years. You know, they built the church with the room for the dome, but they couldn't figure out how to build the dome. And again, that's emblematic. Uh, Florence is a great city for seeing the revival of pagan antiquity in the uh, old city hall. One floor is pagan and one floor is Christian in it. And the pagan floor is on top of the Christian floor, I might point out. Uh, 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 so yes, <laughs> I think Shakespeare, um, let me put it you know, sort of fa fancily, uh, that in theoretical terms, he was interested in humanity and human possibilities, and he understood that all human possibilities are not possible at all times and everywhere. And to, and to see a kind of hero of the proportions of Coriolanus, you had to go back to a pagan Rome where valor was held to be the chiefest virtue. Where you go from there is complicated. Uh, Coriolanus is not a figure you'd immediately right. want to emulate. But I think Shakespeare was trying to show uh, we need some of this. So that in Henry V, uh, the chorus, beginning Act Five, compares Henry's return to London to a Roman Caesar returning in triumph uh, uh, to, to Rome. Also, by the way, compares it to what they hoped would be the Earl of Essex triumphal return from Ireland, having conquered the rebels there. Didn't quite work out that way. But that's a fascinating moment, beginning of Act Five of, of Henry V, when Shakespeare correlates yeah. Roman Caesars, Henry V, and the Earl of Essex. Uh, and it shows you that he did hope to weave together the Roman and the British into the contemporary world. And I think his history plays uh, which are filled with classical references, yeah. uh, are an effort to show how we, we could recapture some of this military virtue necessarily changed in a, in a Christian context. And some context. civic Republican yes. virtue by contrast perhaps with Crusades, which Henry V uh, doesn't. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, Henry V <laughs> abandons the crusader yeah. ideal of his to father be, to, be, to uh, something much more practical, which would be to conquer France. And indeed, I, I think that the, uh, the, the history plays are an attempt to modify the British monarchy on classical Republican models. And no less than Montesquieu said that. Wow. You know, Montesquieu in the Spirit of the Laws says there's a great nation which appears to be a monarchy but is really a republic. Uh, and he meant England because he could see already that parliament uh, taking over, was yeah. taking over. And, you know, obviously had chosen the monarch in 1688. <laughs> so I think sh the Shakespeare is part of a broader movement, which we call the Renaissance, uh, to look back to classical antiquity and extract from it what was still valuable. Uh, Final question, I'm just curious, is Coriolanus still your favorite of the three plays? Do you even have a favorite? There's so you know, how, can, I, how can you pick a favorite among those? I yes, I, I, you know, it is fine. By and large... It's I mean, so much less well-known, would you yes, still say well, today? Yes, that, well, so I'm a contrarian. That's good. No, uh, that's good. Uh, you fine. know, and, uh, I think King Lear is Shakespeare's greatest play and therefore the greatest achievement of the human race. Uh, Hamlet, a close second. But personal favorite, you know, all of this goes back to a little kid being transfixed by a voice on radio. It turns out it was Richard Burton, by the way. Is that uh, right? Yeah, playing Coriolanus. Uh, and and uh, I just was amazed at the rhetoric. And uh, uh, it, 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 one shouldn't reveal too much about oneself, but I'm just attracted to the integrity and the honesty of Coriolanus. Uh, he has the worst opening lines of any character in Shakespeare. He says to the plebeians, what's the matter, you dissentious rogues, that rubbing the poor itch of your opinion make yourselves scabs? 
Not the best way to ingratiate yourself. I confess that most of my life I have to put up with people and you can't say what you really think about them. And I think what really attracts me to Corey Lane is, is this guy, uh, 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 what is... Uh, uh, what his brain thinks, his mouth speaks, someone says. Of it. And, you know, the courage of that, yeah. uh, the unwillingness to back down. And, of course, he's got the old unfair ground. I could beat 40 of them so he can back up what he says. And he's so outrageous. Uh, uh, I generally am attracted to the opposite of what I am in literature. And uh, it always frustrates me that now you're supposed to like the literature of your people. Right. Uh, I remember I was explaining to them, some students at the University of Virginia that I teach this course and I start with the Iliad and then I do the Odyssey. Uh, and they said, oh, are you Greek? <laughs> yeah, I'm an ancient Greek. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, you know, my whole point, when I go to literature, it's to find something different. Right. And Corinthians is so different, and it's the kind of person that, in fact, is rejected in our world. And so I'm a kind of contrarian. I'm attracted to it. So it's a kind of personal favorite, partially because it is uh, not very popular at all. The, but in general, uh, you know, again, Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello, and King Lear are very, very great plays. Uh, but I really would like to put Corey Lane's Julius Caesar and Anthony Cleopatra in the same category, and I think... You know, uh, they really show a side of Shakespeare and his profundity, his ability. It's an archaeological ability to recreate an ancient pagan community yeah. at a time when it was not well understood. Uh, 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 the Aeneid had obliterated the Iliad for the Middle Ages. And, you know, Aeneas is halfway Christian, pious Aeneas, and Christianity made its peace. Dante could have Virgil accompany right. him in the afterlife. So I, you know, I, re I really admire the ancient Greeks and Romans. I did before I came to Shakespeare, but in many ways he reinforced that. And studying, I feel I've learned so much about what makes the ancient world different by pursuing pursuing Shakespeare. And so I, ha you know, I have this particular affection for Coriolanus because of his role in my life. Oh, well, that's great. Well, thank you for explaining this, or beginning to explain this to us. And we'll go to the books, your book, and go to Shakespeare. Oh, and, above uh, all, uh, go to Shakespeare. And, and go to both and, and, and learn more. It's been terrifically interesting for me and stimulating. And Paul Cantor, thank you so much for joining well, me today. Thank you for having me here. I'm a kind of evangelist for Shakespeare. That's a good thing to be an evangelist for, I think. And thank you for joining us on Conversations.